Good morning, America. The heat wave affecting nearly 170 million Americans turns deadly. The summer scorcher putting more than half the country on alert for dangerous heat. Indexes reaching triple digits. This NFL player dying of apparent heat stroke. Roads buckling in the soaring temperatures. New York City's power grid under strain just days after a blackout. Take this very seriously. What you can do to stay safe. Ship seized Iran capturing a British flagged oil tanker detaining the crew. Tensions rising in the strategic Strait of Hormuz, a critical channel for the world's oil shipments. President Trump's reversal, walking back his disapproval of racist chants at a recent rally. Those are incredible people. Those are incredible patriots. And launching a fresh attack against Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Spider-Man moves. The man scales an apartment building on fire in a daring climb 15 stories up. If anybody else would have said it, they would do the same thing. Why he risked his life to scale that building. And one giant leap, the historic walk on the moon happening exactly 50 years ago today. As those involved in the mission reflect on this major landmark in space exploration. Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. Hey, good morning, everybody. Let's show that historic video again. 50 years later, the images of Neil Armstrong descending that ladder down to the lunar surface. These images still have the power to amaze. Here's an amazing number. 600 million people around the planet watch this moment live. Coming up, we're, we're going to talk to two people who played a key role in our mission to the moon. That's such a cool moment in history. Yes. And I should warn you guys, I have a little bit of a summer cold I'm fighting through. I feel fine. You're hanging in there, though. But, yeah, so just bear with me this you morning. Will, of course. First, though, coming up, we start with that dangerous heat across much of the country. Look at the map. Heat alert in 29 states from New Mexico to Maine. This really is a dangerous situation. At least one person has already died. And we have these images from the sweltering subway platforms here in New York City. This intense heat is putting a strain on the city's power grid. So we begin with ABC's Kaylee Hartung, who's inside Con Ed's Emergency Response Center. Kaylee, good morning. Good morning, Wit. Officials from Con Edison telling me this morning they are very confident New York's power grid can handle the stress. While the forecast has been preparing people across the country all week long for these conditions, power companies have been preparing all year. This morning, more than half the country is on alert for dangerous heat. New York, one of 29 states with soaring temperatures. Overnight, thousands of subway commuters were forced to wait in sweltering underground stations for hours after a network communications issue brought service to a halt. This strain coming just one week after a blackout affected Manhattan. Con Edison dedicating 4,000 crew members to responding to any issues that might arise. We expect demands this weekend to rival um, all-time weekend peaks. In Baltimore, as the heat index reached triple digits, thousands were without power. While crews work to get the lights back on, the loss of electricity under investigation. In Chicago, firefighters were called to rescue a six-month-old baby who was trapped in a hot car for at least 10 minutes. Temperatures reaching 112 degrees, the baby expected to be okay. In Arkansas, former NFL lineman and Super Bowl champion Mitch Petras died of an apparent heat stroke Thursday night after working outside in brutal conditions all day. As temperatures broke 100 in Kansas and Iowa, roads have started buckling. And in Wisconsin, first responders battled two massive fires, enduring 90-degree heat before getting the flames under control. The combination of heat plus humidity could make it feel 5 to 10 degrees warmer here, even harder on our bodies. Airlines taking extra measures for outside employees providing extra breaks in air-conditioned break rooms, cooling stations, and cooling neck bands. Hospitals on heightened alert. What are your greatest concerns in these extreme temperatures? The body's normal mechanisms, which usually regulate temperature, fail to work. And this could lead to multiple problems, inflammation, cell death, and eventually organ failure. 
Here in Con Edison's Emergency Response Center, they're monitoring the usage of the more than 9 million customers they serve. You can see on this screen behind me the highest usage right now in Brooklyn's and Queens. That is to be expected on a weekend. Dan, officials here tell me they're glad this weather isn't hitting the area on a Tuesday because that would mean higher usage in Manhattan when you think about all of those office buildings, the air conditioners and the elevators that they would use. Yeah, well, Dan. speaking for me and Eva, we're <laughs> glad that the power uh, seems to be working because we lived through a blackout last weekend. Uh, Kaylee, thank you very much. And we also want to acknowledge while we have you, this is your first time on our show. So we'd like to welcome you to the Good Morning America family. Well, thank you guys for that. I am thrilled to be a part of the team and glad to be indoors with power at the moment. Okay. <laughs> That's a good point. Yes, we exactly. took it easy on you for your yeah. first assignment. Thanks again, Kaylee. <sighs> Kaylee and I used to work together as well oh. years ago, so I can vouch for her. All Not right. sure if she can do the same for me, though, but we won't give her that answer. Kaylee, good to have you on the team. We do want to transition, though, to the escalating tensions with Iran, the U.S. intensifying air patrols over the Strait of Hormuz after Iran seized a British oil tanker. ABC's Stephanie Ramos is in Washington with the latest on that story. Stephanie, good morning. Wit, good morning. Tensions between Iran and the U.S. have been escalating since President Trump withdrew the U.S. last year from the nuclear deal and imposed economic sanctions on Iran. But this latest move by Iran seizing that British tanker is possibly one of their more significant escalations since May. Iran making its next move, seizing a British flagged tanker with 23 crew members on board, traveling through the Strait of Hormuz. Iranian officials initially said it violated international maritime laws, but now say the British tanker collided with an Iranian fishing boat. A Liberian flagged tanker was also briefly seized, but later released. President Trump responding to the bold move Friday. We don't have very many tankers going in, but we have a lot of ships there that are warships and we'll talk to the UK. The British Foreign Secretary says he's extremely concerned by the seizure, calling it unacceptable, even telling UK shipping to avoid the Strait of Hormuz for now. President Trump calling out Iran. This only goes to show what I'm saying about Iran. Trouble, nothing but trouble. This incident comes just two days after the U.S. claimed one of its warships downed an Iranian drone in this same area. Iran says, however, it did not lose an aircraft, releasing this video to prove it, claiming the video is from the drone the U.S. supposedly destroyed. The timestamp, however, is after the hour the U.S. says the drone went down. You shot down the drone yesterday. There's no doubt about that, right? Uh, no and doubt about it. No, we, we shot it down. Military officials say the U.S. has intensified air patrols over the Strait of Hormuz in response to this latest tanker seizure. The U.K.'s foreign secretary says they're not looking at military options, but instead looking at a diplomatic way to resolve the situation and add that if the situation is not resolved quickly, there will be serious consequences. Eva. All right, Stephanie Washington for Stephanie Ramos for us in Washington. Here at home, President Trump is doubling down on his criticisms of four Democratic congresswomen while defending attendees of his rally who chanted, send her back. ABC's White House correspondent Tara Palmieri live with more. Good morning to you this morning, Tara. Good morning, Eva. The president seems to want it both ways. Just this morning, he tweeted about the controversy again, saying that he didn't lead the crowd in on into this racist chant. He said that he wasn't happy with the chant either, but then goes on to call his supporters patriots and said they did it because they love the USA. This morning, a defiant President Trump. You can't talk that way about our country. Not when I'm the president. Walking back his disapproval of these racist chants. Directed at four minority congresswomen. Instead, defending his supporters. Those are incredible people. Those are incredible patriots. And doubling down with another attack against Minnesota Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. But I'm unhappy when a congresswoman goes and says, I'm going to be the president's nightmare. She's lucky to be where she is. We are going to continue to be a nightmare to this president. This reversal comes just one day after the president told reporters that he felt uncomfortable with the uproar at that rally in North Carolina, where attendees echoed these earlier tweets from nearly a week ago. After telling Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, Ayanna Presley, 
and Ilan Omar to, quote, go back to the countries they came from, the president has railed against the four congresswomen for days. They hate our country. They can leave, they can stay, but they should love our country. All four lawmakers are American citizens. Three were born in the U.S., and Omar was born in Somalia. And while the president does not appear to be backing down, another voice has joined the public outrage. Former First Lady Michelle Obama, who had this to say. What truly makes our country great is its diversity. We must remember, it's not my America or your America. It's our America. This latest firestorm might be a sign of what's to come in 2020. The president embracing a campaign based on racial divisions and identity politics. It's not unlike how he started his first campaign by calling Mexicans rapists. Dan. Tara Palmieri in New Jersey, thank you. A lot to talk about here this morning, so let's bring in ABC News Chief Political Analyst Matthew Dowd, who joins us from Texas. Matthew, what's your, what's your take on, on this flurry of comments from President Trump about the center back chant? Do, is he walking back his uh, walk back from Thursday, or do his new comments in any way nullify his apparent disavowal from Thursday? Well, uh, to paraphrase John Kerry, he was for it before he was against it, before he was for it again. I, I think all of us know Donald Trump. We've known him since he came down the escalator when he called Mexicans rapists. I, I don't think Donald Trump can walk away from it, not only because of his constituency, but because of who Donald Trump is. This is who Donald Trump is. I think we have to be clear about that. But I think Donald Trump tried to get credit for a walk back. But again, within 24 hours, he was right back in the middle of it. So, uh, Tara Palmieri was just saying just a, a few moments ago from New Jersey where the president is spending the weekend uh, that she thinks this is the way he's going to campaign in 2020. So I, I'm just wondering from the standpoint of a, you know, cold clinical political calculation, do racially charged comments help or hurt the president with the voters in the key states that he needs to win in 2020? Well, I, I think, I've won. I think the president just does these things. It's guttural. I don't think he has some grand political strategy. So, but I think when the president, ever since he took office, has not made one step to expand his constituency. And every day he goes without expanding his constituency, when he started with 46 and he's dropped, is a bad day for the president. I think it helps consolidate his base, but it doesn't do anything to expand his constituency to get to a point where he can again take Michigan, again take Pennsylvania, he can again take Wisconsin. He has a solid base and he continues to solidify that but it's a smaller and smaller base. And one thing I'll point out on this day of the lunar landing, Dan, is that the Democrats have to not go small and divisive. They have to go big, just like the landing. For thousands of years, we men and women looked at the moon in awe and curiosity, and then from a, being unified, do the common good, through working di diligently, we were able to set a man on the moon 50 years ago today. So Democrats need to go big just like that and not be small and divisive as the president seems to have a strategy of. More Democratic presidential debates coming up very soon. Matthew Dow, we really appreciate your analysis as always. Thank you, sir, and have a great day. Whit, over to you. Dan, thank you. And other stories we're following this morning, more protests in Puerto Rico as U.S. officials and presidential candidates join the calls for the governor to resign. Governor Ricardo Rosselló's official residence under siege as thousands of Puerto Ricans have taken to the streets over the last several days after a series of private chats between Rosselló and his associates were leaked. The governor allegedly insulting women, his political opponents, and even victims of Hurricane Maria in those chats. Some scary moments aboard a cruise ship on its way to Alaska from Seattle. The celebrity solstice had to make a U-turn and return to port following a power outage shortly after it took off Friday <laughs> evening. The Coast Guard helped guide the ship back to port where they say power came back on. No one was hurt. The celebrity cruise ship will have to undergo an inspection before it can head back out to sea. Now to a murder mystery on a highway in Canada. An American woman and her boyfriend killed during a road trip. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez is in our Los Angeles bureau with what that woman's family is saying. Good morning, Marcy. Good morning, Eva. They are, of course, heartbroken, saying the two were brutally killed. And while police aren't sharing many details, the big concern is that the killer is still on the run. This morning, an urgent manhunt in the mysterious murder of an American woman and her boyfriend in Canada. Their bodies found along the side of a rural highway. I don't know who would do something like this. This was someone's son, someone's daughter. 
China Deez's mother says the 24-year-old from Charlotte and her Australian boyfriend Lucas Fowler had just set out on a road trip to see Canada's national parks when they were killed sometime between Sunday evening and Monday morning. Their van found parked nearby. It's the kind of love story you read about. I remember feeling a little bit concerned thinking, you know, what if she moves to Australia? That's really far. Well, today I would take Australia. Police are also not saying how they were killed. Now urging anyone who was on that stretch of Alaska Highway 97 in British Columbia and may have dash cam video from the area to call investigators who are desperately scouring for leads. We're trying to comb through the evidence that is at the scene at this point. Deez's family concerned the killer is still free. This morning, they are pleading for answers. It doesn't add up, and it's concerning, and uh, we're never going to get full closure on this, and it's going to hurt the rest of our lives. And Fowler's father is a senior police officer in Australia. This morning, his colleagues say they've learned both victims were shot to death. Investigators in Canada are also clarifying that this does not appear to be connected to any other cases, and they call finding this killer their top priority. Dan. Let's hope it is. Marcy Gonzalez, thank you very much. Moving on now, an American man is under arrest, accused of being an ISIS fighter. Prosecutors say 42-year-old Ruslan Asinov is in federal custody. He's facing terror charges. He's a naturalized U.S. citizen. He was born in Kazakhstan, and he left for Brooklyn from uh, left Brooklyn rather from for Syria in 2013. And that's where prosecutors say Asinov joined ISIS. He became a sniper and then a trainer of new recruits. He was arrested after allegedly enticing a person who turned out to be an NYPD informant to join. ISIS. Credit reporting company Equifax is reportedly nearing a deal to pay out close to $700 million to settle numerous data breach investigations by federal and state agencies, as well as a class action lawsuit. The investigations were sparked by a hack in 2017 that exposed millions of Americans' personal data, including names, social security numbers, and birth dates. The settlement would allegedly establish a fund to help those harmed by the breach and require Equifax to make changes in how it secures data. Let's get back to the weather and that dangerous heat this morning. Brittany Bell from our ABC station in Raleigh, North Carolina is in for Rob this morning. Brittany, welcome and good morning to you. And good morning to you too. That dangerous heat wave continues all across the country. Check out our heat alerts. They stretch from New Mexico all the way towards Maine. We have a heat advisory and an excessive heat warning. That means we can see an extended period of those dangerous real field temperatures. Speaking of that, this is what it's going to feel like heading through this afternoon, Oklahoma City up to 105 degrees. Check out Washington, D.C. It's going to feel like 110 and then also farther to the north near Cleveland, 101 degrees. And to make matters worse, these lows, we won't see any relief throughout the overnight hours. We'll have those low temperatures struggling to get below 80 degrees. And even early Sunday morning, it's already going to feel very hot. It's going to feel like 87 in Charleston. Look at Washington, D.C. It's going to feel like 91 degrees and then still very hot throughout Sunday afternoon. Heat index values in the 90s and the triple digits once again. That's a look at what's happening across the country. Here's a look at what's happening in your neighborhood. Hello and good morning, Washington. Excessive heat warning today. We will have that dangerous combination of heat and humidity. High temperatures near 100 degrees, making it feel like 110 to 115. Tomorrow, more of the same. Add in the chance for a couple of storms as well. So we will have the heat, the humidity, also ahead of a cold front, chance for some storms, I think, after 4 o'clock on your Sunday. As far as the heat index values today and tomorrow, again, near 110 each day, going back near 100 on Monday. Finally, a break in the heat Tuesday of next week. So just very hot again today, but we do finally have some relief heading into next week in the way of a cold front. So we just have to be patient. I'm just so, get through the weekend. Yes. Cling to that. Yeah. I'm so happy to have you here because today we actually outnumber the men at the hey, show. Oh, that's right. Ladies. <laughs> I just noticed that I looked at it and I was like, for what? Little girl power. See the yes. uncomfortable smile? <laughs> we, just, we just smile and nod. Yes, yes. Well, uh, a, Thank a, you. a feel good story this morning for us to focus on. A man in Philadelphia risked life and limb as he climbed up an apartment building on fire. And now we're learning more about why he did it. ABC's Diane Macedo is here with this story. Good morning. Good morning to you. So, this man, Jermaine, works in construction. He's used to climbing, but he never expected he would use the
used that training like this when he arrived to a burning building and learned his mother was trapped inside. It's a heart-pounding and heartwarming tale of bravery. A man scaling a 19-story burning building in Philadelphia with the hopes of reaching his mother trapped inside. I'm not just going to sit there and let my mom die. I'd rather risk my life falling than let her sit in there and die. Sometime after 9.30 p.m., Jermaine received a call from his sister saying his 65-year-old immobile mother couldn't make it out of her apartment on the 15th floor.